During his criminal career, Giovanni Johnny Torrio, also known as the Fox, or as Al Capone affectionately called him, Johnny Papa, operated in the shadows of the underworld. He believed as a member of a secret society, he should remain secretive, and this he did throughout his career, allowing others to hog the limelight. J. Robert Nash explains, throughout his 50 years of crime, Torrio's abiding credo and standing order to his stooges and killers, including Capone was, no one is ever to mention my name, no one. Torrio became a legend in both New York and Chicago. Starting out as a street thug in the former, Torrio was the only top underworld figure who began in the vicious street gangs of New York and yet never established a police record. Not because he was never directly involved in crime. On the contrary, Torrio was involved in numerous gang wars, murders of rival gangsters, prostitution, and bootlegging. It was simply that he was extremely careful and highly intelligent. Torrio was born in southern Italy, though the town remains a mystery. Various reports have him born on the 20th of either January or February in 1882, and immigrating with his widowed mother to New York two years later. When he was 22 years old, he purchased a bar on the corner of James and Walker Street in New York. He rented out the upper floors in the adjacent building, from which he ran a brothel consisting of 25 professional girls. For protection, he recruited a number of brutal thugs, forming his own mob, which became known as the James Street Gang. In typical Torrio fashion, something which would distinguish him throughout his career, Torrio cemented friendship with other gang leaders, especially Paul Kelly of the infamous Five Points Gang. So close was their relationship that in a short period of time, Torrio became Kelly's top lieutenant. After a long street war with a rival gang known as the Monk Eastman Gang, Torrio saw the handwriting on the wall. Tammany Hall was getting tired of all the bodies laying in the street and ordered the gangs to back off. Numerous arrests were made and Torrio gracefully bowed out. He sold his bar and his whorehouse and moved to Chicago. Torrio's cousin had married Big Jim Colosimo and Big Jim needed help running his rackets in the Windy City. When Colosimo began receiving extortion letters from a blackhander, Johnny made the problem go away, taking out the blackmailer's muscle. Such ruthlessness was appreciated by Big Jim, who then made Torrio his right-hand man. Torrio abhorred violence. He preferred to reason with his enemies. And if worse came to worse, he would simply buy them out. But when he found out that one of his guards had been paid off to kill him, Torrio sent for a protege he had left behind in New York, a strong, fearless lad with ham hock fist and one who had proven himself many times over in the old street wars of New York. His name was Alphonse Capone. When the Volstead Act became the law of the land, Torrio and Capone saw dollar signs. But Big Jim refused to get involved. They couldn't reason with him. He didn't need the money, he told them, and so Torrio and Capone forced Big Jim to retire permanently. Torrio flourished in Chicago, even during the gang war with the Northsiders headed up by Dion O'Banion. In May of 1924, O'Banion came to the duo telling Torrio he had made enough money and he was going to retire the rackets. He wanted to sell his mid-city brewery. Just like that, Capone said, snapping his fingers, yeah, Al, me boy. And he too snapped his fingers, just like that. Torrio was extremely happy. This is the way he liked to do business. Buy out the competition. Don't blast them out. O'Banion's asking price was half a million dollars, and Torrio quickly agreed. O'Banion and Torrio decided to meet on May 19th at the brewery to begin the process of signing everything over. J. Robert Nash explains what happened next. Torrio was not inside the brewery for more than 10 minutes when Police Chief Collins, leading 20 men, raided the place, 
arresting O'Banion, Earl Jaime Weiss, and Torrio. O'Banion and Jaime smiled happily. This was their first arrest for violating prohibition laws. Torrio fumed. He had been arrested in June of 1923 and had been freed after paying a fine. A second arrest would mean a jail term, a fact which O'Banion knew. Clearly, O'Banion had set up Torrio. He had no intention of retiring, and he knew the brewery was about to be raided and closed down. He figured he would sell it for a large amount of money and get Torrio off the street for a while. But O'Banion didn't count on one thing, Johnny Torrio's retaliation. After O'Banion was shot down in his flower shop on Torrio's orders, the Northside gang and its leaders, Jaime Weiss, Vincent the Screamer Drucci, and George Bugs Moran marked Torrio for death. They almost got him, but he survived the vicious attack, receiving a wound to his neck. Throughout his life, he would cover up this wound with a scarf. Torrio then decided things were too hot in Chicago, so he handed the whole operation over to Capone, and he left Chicago never to return. Torrio and his wife Anna headed to Florida for a brief stay. Then he spent three years in Naples, Italy, but he grew bored, missing his old career. Finally, he told Anna he couldn't take it anymore, and so they packed their bags and returned to his old stomping grounds, New York City. He started out in real estate, but eventually began a liquor import business, partnering with Abner Longney Zwillman, Meyer Lansky, and Charles Lucky Luciano. Within a year, he was reaping millions of dollars in profits, not only for himself, but for his partners. During this time, Johnny Torrio received another nickname, The Brain. For years, he had been planning, along with Arnold Rothstein and Meyer Lansky, a national crime syndicate, a commission, if you will, of all the gangs throughout the United States and the world. Remaining in the background and considering himself more of a thinker, Torrio agreed the job of doer should go to Charles Luciano, another highly intelligent and industrious mobster who had already proven himself as an organizer. Besides, Luciano seemed to like the limelight, and Torrio didn't, and this may have ended up being another stroke of genius on Torrio's part. The newly formed National Commission quickly came under scrutiny by authorities. Within six years of its formation, Luciano, the newly crowned head of the National Commission, was sent to prison for a 30 to 50 year stretch. It wasn't until 1939 that Torrio faced a two and a half year prison sentence for tax evasion. He was released on April 14, 1941 and went into semi-retirement, still enjoying his role as an elder statesman of crime, being called on periodically to help mediate and settle disputes between gangs. On April 16, 1957, Johnny Papa went to the barber shop. As he sat in the barber's chair, he began to convulse and then slipped into unconsciousness. He died just as he had lived quietly and without much fanfare. J. Robert Nash notes in an ironic twist of fate, Torrio's passing was completely overlooked by the press, and it was three weeks before obituary writers got around to linking him with criminal activity and the bootleg wars of Chicago. <laughs>